Thank you very much. And Rachel, thank you very much for the invitation to speak here today. I'm not a mathematician. I was trained in physics and in atmospheric science. So um, the mathematicians may have some interesting questions and comments for me. But I would like to point out that having worked at a national laboratory for seven years and now at a second national laboratory, it's been my experience that when we have interdisciplinary groups working together where we have mathematicians and physicists and computer scientists and, and people um, from all different disciplines, we tend to accomplish our tasks much faster, much more efficiently. So um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and, and talk to you, and I appreciate your insights. And I also note that it is right after lunch, and many of us had pasta. So in order <laughs> for this to be a stimulating and interactive uh, presentation, it would be much easier if this was a discussion. So I want to encourage you to ask questions if you have them and, and not hold them until the end of the presentation. OK. Now, as many of you know, we don't do science or math in a vacuum. That Many of us do our best work with colleagues. So I, I first need to acknowledge my colleagues from Lawrence Livermore, Veronica Kosovich, who now works at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, Jeff Maraca, Katie Lundquist, Reed Maxwell, who's now at the Colorado School of Mines, the postdoc Sonia Wharton, and Livermore did contribute substantial internal research funding to my work there. I've also really enjoyed uh, collaborations with Professor Tina Chow and her graduate student Katie Lundquist at Berkeley. And then the Department of Energy has been very supportive of our work. So we're talking about wind energy this afternoon. And before we get too much into the details of wind energy, I wanted to give an overview of the energy challenge and sustainability in general and why I think wind energy can be a viable component of our energy portfolio going forward. Then we'll discuss the technical challenges with incorporating substantial fractions of wind energy into our power grid. I'll talk about numerical weather prediction, and then for the mathematicians, I'm going to talk about the Navier-Stokes equations. And then one of the really interesting technical challenges with turbulence modeling, especially as we go from Reynolds averaged forms of the Navier-Stokes equations to large eddy simulations. And then we'll conclude with a forward look. So the energy challenge. Uh, this is um, some information from the United Nations. It used to be that when we tried to evaluate quality of life in different countries, people would look at the gross domestic product. But that only gives you one picture of how people are faring. So about 20 years ago, the United Nations Human Development Initiative decided that it was proper to, instead of just looking at prosperity, to also look at um, individuals' access to knowledge and information, their education, as well as their health status or their lifespans. So this is called the Human Development Index, and I think Harry referred to it this morning as well. And you can see that there's a very strong correlation between how much electricity people use and their human development index. So in the United States and in most of Western Europe, we're at very high levels, close to one. And in developing countries, values are lower. And generally, as people increase their access to electricity, their human development index goes higher. Now, something else that's interesting to note is that in the United States, almost half of our carbon dioxide emissions, these are the, the gases that are thought to lead to, to global climate change, over half of those emissions come from electrical power generation. So if we want to maximize our standard of living or the standard of living of people around the world, we need to address the fact that we get our electricity currently from fossil fuel sources, and we need to expand that portfolio to look um, to other sources of energy. Which brings us to wind energy. Now, the Department of Energy has looked at several different scenarios for how much penetration of different types of renewables can we support in our power grid. And the blue line on this curve kind of gives the, the current, the status quo line. So if we didn't change anything about how we used energy, we would continually increase emissions of CO2 into the atmosphere just in the United States. This isn't considering all of the countries that are rapidly developing now and increasing their CO2 emissions. But we would be continually increasing our emissions every year along the line of that blue line. And the atmosphere doesn't really care about emissions. The atmosphere cares about concentrations. So you can see that as we increase emissions, there, there's a cumulative effect of even higher and higher concentrations, which can lead to more climate tipping points. Now, the uh, Department of Energy study that looked to see if it was viable to have 20% of wind penetration in our national power grid noted that if we were to able to achieve that, then we would be able to at least flatten out our CO2 emissions, which is, of course, the first step towards reducing atmospheric concentrations. 
And then the, the nice green line at the bottom is an extremely idealized and very optimistic path that would be great if we could achieve. It would probably require significant economic adjustments as well. That's a good question. The question was, uh, what other assumptions about other energy sources went in here? And we weren't, well, I didn't actually work on this study, but the Department of Energy was not looking at anything other than wind and how the increase of wind penetration would adjust the way that we use coal and natural gas. So this doesn't say anything about the use of hydropower or solar power nuclear. or nuclear. That's true. Okay, any more questions? Okay. So obviously wind energy is, is becoming attractive and because it's a relatively mature renewable energy, we know how to build wind turbines, we know basically how to site them with, with some caveats that I'll discuss later. So there's been a lot of investment in the past few years. Um, in the United States, we still get less than 2% of our electricity from wind generation, but that's growing quite rapidly. The last two years have seen really substantial growth. Um, in 2008, we added 8,300 megawatts of wind, and last year we hit almost 10,000 megawatts, which is kind of interesting considering the economic downturn. We were still able to, to install a lot of wind turbines. Some countries, like Denmark, have even higher penetration, so about 20% of their electrical power comes from wind. And given their location and given the way that the European power grid is set up, they can actually export a lot of their wind-generated electricity to uh, power-hungry countries like Germany and Norway. So there are several reasons why wind is a particularly attractive um, renewable energy source. And, and I want to be very clear here that I'm not one of the people who argues that my renewable energy is better than your renewable energy. I think that um, a renewable energy portfolio solution is really where we want to go. So please don't interpret my language here as, as that kind of jockeying. But uh, wind does reduce um, CO2 emissions uh, substantially, especially when compared to coal or natural gas. Uh, after the turbines are manufactured, there's no hazardous waste. We don't have to mine um, rare earth metals or things like that. Uh, there's very little environmental damage except for the initial installation of a wind turbine. And there are no water requirements for wind. And that makes wind very attractive in the southwest and in California where we are water limited. And other technologies, other competitive technologies like coal and nuclear do require substantial amounts of water. Okay, so moving on to some of the interesting technical challenges in wind energy. This is where you guys are supposed to get inspired and go forth to, to do great things with your mathematical skills. As you are probably aware, the wind doesn't blow all of the time, and so we consider it a fluctuating renewable energy resource. So things like coal and natural gas are considered dispatchable, which means somebody says, okay, I want this many megawatts, I flip a switch, and I get it. With wind, you are dependent on what the atmosphere is actually doing, and as with solar and with hydropower as well. So our power grid, in order to support substantial amounts of wind energy, will have to be modified so that we can integrate this fluctuating power with our fluctuating demand into a, a power grid that's stable. And so this is essentially an optimization problem. There are other questions about siting wind turbines, especially the large industrial scale turbines. We have used a lot of our flat terrain, and now there's a lot of rugged terrain areas where we would like to site wind turbines. But although you want a lot of wind and a lot of high velocity, you don't want a lot of turbulence. And something interesting happens when you develop large wind turbines. You're sampling a part of the atmosphere that, although it's higher and has higher wind speeds, it also has a lot more turbulence. So we need to have very accurate modeling tools to characterize the atmosphere in which we're placing these turbines. Those are cows in that picture. This is Alberta, Alberta, Canada. And one of the nice, um, or one of the user-friendly features of wind energy is that once you put up a turbine, most of the land that it's on can be returned to other purposes. So I think that the latest figure that I read was something like, if you have an acre of land and you put up a turbine, 97% of that land is, is left usable for farming or for, for grazing, that type of stuff. I don't know which type of cows those are, though. Uh, another challenge with wind energy is uh, 
and I always hesitate to use this picture because it's very dramatic and it gets people very concerned, but there are issues of premature fatigue on gearboxes and even blades that happen usually when turbines are installed in areas where the atmosphere is more complex than was realized when people went out and did their initial resource assessment. So of course there can be hardware failures and the manufacturers that I've worked with try very, very hard to make sure that that never happens, but they can't control the atmosphere. So they need help from meteorologists and mathematicians to understand what kind of atmosphere they're really inserting the turbines in. Yeah. <laughs> okay, everybody, ready? Blow. <laughs> That one exploded. Huh? That one exploded. There was, I, I don't know the details. This is a German, um, this is cited in Germany. I don't remember which manufacturer it was, but there was actually a fire in the back of the nacelle. And I don't know if it was electrical shortage or what. But, yeah. Okay, and finally, when we think about large arrays of wind turbines, which will happen more and more, we need to think about the effects of the wakes of individual turbines. So just as you walk behind a building or walk behind a tree, you feel a lessening of the, the wind flow. This happens with wind turbines as well. And this is a particularly beautiful picture of sea smoke at Horns Reef, which is a large wind farm off the coast of Denmark. And the wind turbines aren't actually generating the smoke. We'll look at it a little bit closer. They're actually picking up some sea mist that was at the surface of the ocean, and it's actually spiraling up and, and persisting in the area of the wake. But it's important to look at this because it helps you realize that when, you, um, when you're trying to model or trying to forecast how much energy you'll actually collect from your wind farm, you need to think about the effects of the turbines on each other and on the land around them. So that's a very hot topic right now because many large wind farms are going up. Is there a question in the middle? Okay. Well, except for that the wind direction is always changing. So, yeah, yeah, so they, they, they really lucked out with this. They were actually going out to do maintenance on some of the turbines and had this beautiful day. So, um, which your comment brings me to the next point, that if you actually look at observations of power that you collect from wind turbines, you can see this wake effect. So over here, we have wind turbine numbers. So just imagine that there were eight turbines in a row Turbine number one is the first one that samples essentially clean and unmodified air. So the power that it collects is essentially one. And depending on the wind direction coming into the, the line of turbines, so this 15 degree means that it can be up to 15 degrees off of the line of turbines, you get a lessening of the power collected at the downwind turbines. And this is, again, a study at an offshore wind farm, but offshore is really important because there's a lot of offshore in Europe and the the kind of preliminary wake modeling tools that we've had that have worked reasonably well uh, are not working in these large offshore wind farms because of the atmospheric stability. So atmospheric stability is kind of a measure of how disturbed the atmosphere is. If it's a very stable environment, you basically have pancakes of air on top of each other. And if you lift up a parcel, it will go back to where it was and it won't bounce around. So that happens mostly at night or over a cool surface. Uh, during the day, you have a convective situation or unstable, where if you lift a parcel of air, it's going to keep going up, and then you get lots of interesting oscillations. So anyway, we have to, if we're trying to understand how much power we're collecting, we have to understand the atmospheric dynamics and then how that affects the, the actual turbines themselves. So there's a lot of competition right now to develop viable forecasting systems for large wind farms, and wake models are kind of one of the, the stopping points for people. One of the issues is collecting data because manufacturers and wind farm operators aren't that excited about sharing their data with their competitors. But even with data, it's still a very challenging physics and math problem. Okay, so I've just given you a sample of a few of the problems that people can work on with respect to wind energy where there are urgent questions that need to be solved. And about two years ago now, yeah, it was in January of 2008, 120 people who work in wind came together. These are people from academia, uh, scientists from national laboratories and scientists who work in the wind energy industry. They came together and said, okay, what are the problems that are the highest priority that can give us the biggest bang for our bucks? So here's a list of, uh, 12, yeah, of, of 12 topics that are highlighted and discussed in great detail in this report. So if you're interested in what problems are available to be solved, 
in wind energy, I would definitely urge you to, to please write down this link, and I can see you if you're writing or not, and, and take a look at this report because it's a pretty good summary with lots of references and can direct you to other experts in the field. Okay, so now moving on to numerical weather prediction and the Navier-Stokes equations. We're, we're trained in atmospheric science to not put equations in our talks, so it was very, very hard <laughs> for me to, to prepare this for you guys with equations. So I needed to compensate by putting in pictures of, of the people involved. <laughs> No, we're, we're getting there. <laughs> we're getting there. But you, you know, everybody stands on the shoulders of giants, so we'll, we'll start with Newton. And we're all familiar, I hope, with Newton's law, where the force on a body is equal to the change in its mass times its velocity, or if you hold mass constant, then you have mass times acceleration. So this works very nice for uh, rigid bodies. And then Euler realized that this, these physical laws can be applied to fluids as well. And so now we have Euler's equations, which basically says F equals MA for a fluid. And this is applicable to inviscid flow only. So if you're trying to use Euler's equations in a channel, you would have to assume you have a free slip boundary, which doesn't really work in the atmosphere or in the ocean because these are geophysical flows with viscosity. So that brings us to Navier and Stokes. And you're probably aware that Navier was a, a French engineer. And he and George Stokes, who was an Irish mathematician, came up with this modification to Euler's law independently. So we now call it the Navier-Stokes equations. And we have an extra term for viscosity to um, express the fact that this is essentially a frictional drag on the flow. I'm going to bring up something called the Reynolds number here that you'll see at the bottom, which is a non-dimensional number that lets us understand some of the complexities of the flow. And if we were to try to simulate this flow, how many different scales would we have to pay attention to in order to capture everything? So the Reynolds number is a function of a typical velocity, u, in the flow, a typical length scale, l, and the viscosity. Okay, any questions? <laughs> He's really hard to find. <laughs> His Wikipedia page isn't so good. He needs to get a social marketer, I guess. Um, so... How many of you are aware of the Clay Mathematics Institute? Good, okay. So you may be aware that they have these problems that they've deemed the most important problems in mathematics that are still unsolved. And the Navier-Stokes equations actually rate on their list of the top seven open questions. So I guess in, in three dimensions, although you know meteorologists solve these equations in three dimensions through approximations all the time, without making those approximations, it no one has yet shown that there are solutions and that those solutions do not contain a singularity. So should you happen to, to think about this for a little while and come up with a good solution, then it would be prudent to talk to the people at the Clay Mathematics Institute. So uh, this kind of brings up an interesting issue to me because parameterization is something that is so ingrained in my field that we just say, okay, you can't solve it ideally and just go ahead and parameterize it and, and move on. But it is interesting that something that's so fundamental to my work is still kind of open and unsolved in your field. Mm -hmm. It's kind of interesting. Okay, so returning to the Reynolds number, uh, we need to, um, if we wanted to simulate a flow, we could approximate how many grid points we would need to solve that flow by thinking about the Reynolds number. And the idea is that if you have laminar flow, or if you have a flow that has um, a very small length scales compared to its viscosity and, and its velocity, then you could actually solve it directly, numerically. But in the atmosphere, if we assume that we're looking at the atmospheric boundary layer, that's not possible to solve it numerically right now, even with, with supercomputers. So as an example, I chose 10 meters per second because that's a typical you know, horizontal wind flow in the atmospheric boundary layer. One kilometer is a reasonable length scale in the atmospheric boundary layer. Um, we talked a moment ago about stability, and during the day we have convective plumes in the boundary layer, and they usually penetrate up to about a kilometer high during the day. And then if we have roll vortices, then they have um, horizontal length scales of about a kilometer. And the atmospheric viscosity is 10 to the minus fourth, so we would need 10 to the 18th grid points approximately to solve the Navier-Stokes equations, which is not going to happen in the atmosphere any time soon. Even if we were to be able to build a huge supercomputer, 
And Richardson is often thought by meteorologists as, as kind of the father of the numerical weather prediction world. And so I wanted to share this picture. Can you see this in the back that each of these, each of these cells is filled with 20 or 30 people who are supposed to be computers? And this processor in the middle asks or queries that cell, you know, after you did your calculation, what did you get? And then hands it off to the people in the next cell as, as the wind advects through the system. So this is kind of the, the predecessor of, of MPI, or massively parallel um, computing that we use today. So how do we use those supercomputers? Uh, we use them to solve this particular equation. And this is the form of Navier-Stokes that we usually use in the numerical weather prediction world. So I will walk you through this. And if I skip uh, one of the symbols, tell me, because there wasn't enough room to explain everything in words on the slide. So there are three main equations that we think about. Uh, the first one is essentially an equation for momentum, because we're looking at the horizontal velocity v. The second one is essentially an equation for moisture. And the third equation is essentially an equation for potential temperature, which you can think of as temperature kind of corrected for pressure. In meteorology, we try to avoid talking about temperature specifically because we recognize that pressure, you know, the adiabatic law and, or, or the ideal gas law and adiabatic lapse rates and things like that. If you had a parcel of air at sea level that had a temperature of 300 Kelvin and a parcel of air in Boulder, Colorado at 300 degrees Kelvin, they wouldn't be the same because the pressure is so different. So when we're trying to compare atmospheric dynamics or trying to compare different parcels of air to understand the dynamics, we have to correct for this pressure difference. And so that's what potential temperature is. So um, each of the terms of, of this equation are things that you'll probably recognize. On the left-hand side, we usually have time rate of change. The second term is the advection equation. So the time rate of change of momentum um, happens as flow moves through the system. There's a pressure gradient force. Uh, the Coriolis effect is introduced by the rotation of the Earth. There's an effect of gravity and a turbulent momentum flux, and that's where things get interesting. And then there's diffusion. So in each of these equations, we have a diffusion term and a turbulence term and an advection term. In the equation for moisture, we also have a source term. So we think of that as, you know, should we have melt ponds, for example, on the surface? There's going to be some evaporation coming up from the melt ponds. And in the equation for potential temperature, we also have the effects of incoming radiation and the effects of latent heating or cooling, depending on what's happening with the microphysics in the atmosphere. So uh, most of these terms can be addressed exactly or more or less exactly. But life gets kind of interesting when you look at what's happening on the subgrid scale and these turbulent fluxes. So when I said that we saw these equations directly, we assume that the atmosphere or the world is a grid. And this is a picture of the type of, of grid that we usually use when we solve these equations. Um, X and Y are in the horizontal, Z is in the vertical, and we have very, very fine resolution co close to the ground. Not just because that's the most interesting part of the atmosphere, but because that's where things change very, very rapidly. And we have, we have to discretize the atmosphere in the horizontal as well. And we assume in certain types of models that things are more or less homogeneous within any given cell. And that's a very big assumption. And especially when you're thinking about sea ice dynamics and um, you know that the surface is very complicated and things are not homogeneous within the cell. But you have to make an assumption when you're doing this scale of problem. So when we're thinking about numerical weather prediction models, we try to make one kind of assumption for turbulence closure. And that's a very simplistic assumption, and it's just called K-closure, where we say that the fluxes, which are those turbulence terms, and I, I've given you the, the axis at the bottom, are simply a function of the vertical gradients of whatever quantity we're interested in. And that, I'm sorry? Those primes can be either time or space derivatives, w which makes it complicated. So if you're looking at, at data from one particular point, you would, make it, you would assume that you have a time average and that these primes are fluctuating quantities during that time period. But when we're thinking about modeling, we're thinking about these grid cells. And so you can say that there's a mean value within that grid cell, and then you have fluctuating quantities around the mean for that grid cell. Box, yeah. 
Yeah, and, and it's either a space time block depending on your application. That, that, that's a good question. So the easy way to solve this is to just make k a constant and then go forth and do great things, but we usually try to make k a function of some length scale L, and this is often a function of your, your grid cell size. And then the other term next to it is called the turbulent kinetic energy, which is a way of summing up all of those fluctuations within your grid cell or within your, um, your spatial, your, in your time scale cell. So this is, again, relevant for what we call mesoscale models or numerical weather prediction models. So this, the plots that you see in the newspaper or that you get from AccuWeather on the Weather Channel, those are usually coming from numerical weather prediction models. And the idea is that when your grids are one kilometer or a little bit coarser, this assumption of homogeneity is more or less good enough. But when you get to smaller scales, when you're trying to resolve things that are much more interesting, like what is the effect of, of my river on the downwind air? What is the effect of my wind turbine on the downwind air? What is the effect of my, um, of my lead in the sea ice on the downwind air? Then you need to go to much higher resolution models, and we call that large eddy simulation. So you have to understand that at that point, you don't have the ability to make that assumption of homogeneity on your grid anymore but that you are hopefully directly resolving all the interesting dynamics. And so the people who are trying to understand what's happening downwind of wind turbines are usually trying to use large eddy simulations so that they can actually resolve the individual wake vortices. Okay. So here's a picture of some large eddy simulations over mildly complex terrain. So we, um, we're only looking at the bottom kilometer of the atmosphere and it extends out three kilometers in the horizontal. The colors denote temperature. So this is a, an early evening simulation. So you can see that in the valleys, we have pooling of cold air, but that pooling doesn't happen consistently from valley to valley. And in fact, it gets kind of interesting when we have drainage flow from two different sides of the mountain coming into each other. So when I zoom in on that small box where we have that, the kind of sandwich layer of cooled air, if you look closely at the white arrows, which show you the wind direction, you can see that we have strong drainage flow from this side, strong, dra whoops, strong drainage flow from that side, so we actually end up getting some recirculation zones right here. Now, if you were to try to set a wind turbine with a hub height of around 100 meters and a blade tip going up to 180 meters, then you would actually be sampling wind going in different directions, and that's probably not ideal for your operations which is why it's very important to use large eddy simulation if you have it available in complex terrain. So that's large eddy simulation, but when we take a step back to think about weather modeling, we, we do need to use mesoscale numerical weather prediction models so that we can understand what's happening on the very large scale with the pressure gradient differences. And those are what give us the general picture of our daily highs and lows and, and the general picture of our winds. So we like mesoscale models because they give us weather. We can't run them at finer scales because of their turbulence assumptions. We like large eddy simulation models because they give us complexity, but we can't run them at a large enough domain because it's just too computationally intense. So then the magic question is, how do we merge these two modeling tools together to have something that's useful in order for predicting winds in the lower atmosphere so that we can fundamentally <laughs> use wind energy a little bit more? So the approach that we've taken in my group is that we will be nesting, we are nesting large eddy simulations within mesoscale simulations so that we get the advantage of the mesoscale in giving boundary conditions to the large eddy simulation scale, but we can still afford the computational demand. So the plot that I've shown here is kind of an interesting one and it's kind of a famous one in meteorology because it shows that there's a spectral gap between uh, a mesoscale type of energy and a turbulence scale type of energy. So back in the 50s at Brookhaven National Lab, they had measurements um, with it well within the boundary layer between 90 and 130 meters above the surface. And over the course of several months, they were able to create this spectrum of energy as a function of, of wave number or, or a period. And we see in these data that there's a very large peak of energy along the like, weather front scale, multiple days, four days, and some peaks at the semi-diurnal time period. There's not a daily peak, which is kind of interesting, but it is a marine influenced location. There is also a very high peak at the turbulence scale of about one minute. And so this paper helped justify 
back in the days that we were developing numerical weather prediction models, ignoring everything below this scale. So I said, okay, there's not much energy below here that's going to affect large scale, so let's just chop off our models and not try to resolve it anymore. And so therefore, these two types of long-range approaches developed essentially independently from each other because of the spectral gap. Now other people have gone back and tried to observe the spectral gap in other data sets. Some people see it, some people don't, and that's why it's kind of a notorious figure in meteorology. But it does help explain philosophically why modeling has, has gone the direction that it has. So now I'm going to show you a few examples of how we are nesting our large eddy simulations within mesoscale simulations. So um, I, I gave you the, the picture of the grid before, and now we're looking down at essentially a map of an area of interest that's 600 kilometers by 600 kilometers, and the colored contours give you elevation, essentially. And we decide that we're really interested in the center of this domain, so we define a smaller box. And then we say, okay, we were running that first simulation at 12 kilometer horizontal resolution. Let's do another one at four kilometer horizontal resolution using similar surface databases. So when I talk about surface databases, does that mean anything to you guys in terms of, um, yes, no, no. Okay, <laughs> so surface database, surface database is essentially to give the atmosphere a lower boundary condition for what's going on. So the atmosphere needs to know what the topography is like. It needs to know if we're looking at trees or a desert. And there are standardized databases based on NASA observations, based on USGS work that tell us what, ele what elevation of terrain we're looking at and what the surface characteristics are like. So this nesting approach essentially goes, takes a very wide domain in the, in the first domain, so like I said, 600 kilometers by 600 kilometers, and we progressively zoom in on our area of interest, and we use finer resolution in our modeling so that we can capture different physics, because what you can see at 12 kilometer horizontal resolution is different from what you can see at one kilometer horizontal resolution. And obviously the, the train changes as we define our smaller boxes. All of this is RANS right now. These first three domains are essentially RANS or mesoscale simulations. Uh, the decision of where to turn off RANS and where to turn on LES is kind of a controversial one right now. And I've taken the approach, well, I'll, I'll show you in the next slide. Okay. Were there other questions? Okay. So this is a set of seven nested simulations, and with regard to the last question, the top three domains that go down to about one kilometer horizontal resolution are all assumed to be uh, appropriate for RANS. And there's two-way nesting, so that the inner domains are communicating with the outer domains. So, for example, if flow is coming in here, hits this ridge in higher elevation, and then flows down and does interesting things in that valley, we're going to know what interesting things it does in this simulation. And in this simulation, it may take a turn and go up the valley or down the valley, where in this one it might have just whisked over it. But when we use two-way nesting, the domains talk to each other. And this domain tells the coarser one, let's have the flow go up, up the valley. So that's what I mean by two-way nesting. And then we take the information from the third nest and use that as boundary conditions for large eddy simulation domains which is what we see here in domain four, five, six, and seven. And the topography doesn't look very interesting here because we're talking about very small domains. So I, I've given you a refined topographic um, legend there so that you can see that there is actually interesting topography in the smallest domains. So um, I mentioned before that there's no real answer yet about what's an appropriate transition from mesoscale on the top to large eddy simulation on the bottom. And the way that we think about turbulence is fundamentally different between these two, so it's important that we as a, as a field figure out what's the, the appropriate answer for that. So now I'm going to show you some results of these simulations. And this is the A result from one of the mesoscale simulations. So we're looking at essentially a day and a half of simulations 
in the lowest two kilometers of the atmosphere, so the x-axis is time, and we're looking just at one data point, and we're taking a profile at that data point, waiting 20 minutes, taking another profile at that, that data point, and plotting it here. And this is uh, a way to represent the diurnal cycle or the daily cycle of the atmospheric boundary layer. So the reds are warm colors, the blues are cold colors, and we can see that as the sun sets, the ground surface starts to cool, and we get pooling of cold air at the bottom. That's what this blue stuff is. And it happens kind of gradually, but when the sun comes up in the morning, the heating starts extremely quickly. And the second night, well, I always skip over the day because the day is kind of boring from my perspective, but during the day, we have a very well-mixed boundary layer where we have the same potential temperature all the way through the boundary layer. And then at night, things start to cool and we get these interesting kind of wavy patterns. And the question is, if we have a temperature profile that looks like this, we have a wind turbine that's essentially sampling this part of the atmosphere, what kind of effect do those wavy things have on the wind turbine? There's a, a meteorological phenomenon called the nocturnal low-level jet. And this is something that can happen almost every evening in the southern Great Plains, and it happens in many other places as well, where we have strong accelerations just at the top of the stable layer that forms overnight. So we would essentially get strong accelerations here. But when jets bounce around, they generate a lot of turbulence, and that turbulence is problematic for structures, including tall buildings as well as turbines. Why, why do I have what? I think that that's a projection issue because I think it's, I have not noticed them before until you just pointed them out now and I see some blue bands over here that should not be there and I think that it's just the superposition of those blue bands on top of the red. So all of this should be the same dark red, the, those very high frequency bands. I don't think that those are really there in the data. I wish they were there, though. That would be interesting to try to, to explain. <laughs> the low level jet, that's, I didn't quite get what that was. It's something happening right before the night. Yeah, it's, it's, it's easier to look at in the wind, which is what we're going to look at in the next couple of slides. But it's an interesting concept to think about because in the evening, you have cool air close to the surface and residual warm air aloft because the ground basically sucks the heat out of the air once it's no longer being warmed. Th that's not the, the meteorologically correct way to explain it, but that's a good way to, to develop your physical intuition in thinking about it. And because you have cold air under warm air, it's essentially decoupled, so there's no communication anymore between the air aloft and the cool air at the bottom. So the air aloft gets the chance to accelerate, which it does, and then forms this low-level jet. And there can be topographic effects like catabatic winds that can enhance the development of the low-level jet, and that may be what's happening in the Southern Great Plains. But it's a very interesting and very relevant phenomenon for wind energy because it's causing some people to make a lot of money because <laughs> the winds are really strong and some people to lose a lot of money because of the turbulence that accompanies a low-level jet. So now let's look at uh, contours of wind speed, and this may be an easier way to look at low-level jets. And what I wanted to emphasize here is that there are substantial differences in the atmospheric dynamics that we see when we take one modeling approach as compared to another. So this is trying to underscore the importance of, of accurate turbulence modeling in your area of interest. So we, we're looking at the same 36-hour um, time period on the x-axis, and we're, we're zooming in on a lower layer, just the lowest kilometer of the boundary layer. And red wind speeds are high wind speeds, and blue or white wind speeds are low wind speeds. And what we see at night, after the jet develops in the mesoscale world, is that we have a nice strong jet that forms early, is well behaved, looks like something that you would see in a textbook and, and like to teach you. But when we look in the large eddy simulation world, we see that we have winds decelerating, then rapidly accelerating again with the low level jet. But then close to the surface, they're actually being eaten away by some mixing that was introduced by the jet itself. And this has been observed in experimental studies many times where you can actually see turbulent mixing being generated under the nose of this accelerating jet.
So being able to forecast these phenomena are really important for understanding what wind resources are actually there, as well as the turbulence that may adversely impact the wind resource that you're trying to catch. So some other differences that you can see between the mesoscale and the large eddy simulation models are that uh, further aloft in the atmosphere, you see uh, different patterns of, of development over the course of the day. And then, as I pointed out, we have our low-level jet that has uh, different onsets and different behavior in the large eddy simulation world. So this is a point where someone is supposed to ask, how do you know which one is right? Thank you, Rachel. <laughs> and the only way to know which one is right is to have actual observations at your area of interest. And something, yeah, I'll, I'll get to your question in just a second. Um, something that has happened in the last three or four years is the advent of a new measurement technology that lets us actually measure winds this high in the atmosphere. You can imagine that setting up meteorological towers and putting instruments on them gets very challenging once you get above 50 meters. And so uh, mathematicians have played a a significant role in the development of remote sensing instruments that let you leave a box on the ground, send up a beam of light, measure its scattering, and make assumptions about the wind profile. So we weren't able to validate our models until we had good representative data. Is that your question? Uh, yes, um, windmills can vary in height significantly. There are some residential scale windmills that people put on their houses that are maybe 20 feet high. But the wind turbines that I work with primarily are the industrial scale wind turbines that typically have a hub height of 100 meters and a rotor diameter that can be 100 meters or more. No. Okay, that, that's a good point. The, the question is going to the, the issue of vertical resolution. And, and this is actually a very important point because typically when we do numerical weather prediction, we have more levels close to the surface, but more levels actually means like 10 layers within the lowest kilometer. And so when we do forecasting for wind energy purposes, we increase that so that we have a vertical resolution of about 10 meters close to the surface, and then it stretches as we move up. When I talk about um, delta x is equal to 49 meters, that's the horizontal resolution in the simulation, not the vertical resolution. But that's a good question. You had a? Oh, great minds think alike. OK. So this brings me to um, a summary and next steps for the modeling approaches that we're taking to support wind energy. So let's just summarize uh, for a moment that uh, we've established that we are using a lot of energy. We will continue to use more energy as other nations develop and that it's possible and practicable to use wind energy as a viable power source. But in order to do that appropriately, we have to have good forecasting tools. And I've emphasized in this talk forecasting tools for the short-term time scale. So what's going to happen in the next 12 to 36 hours? It's also important to know what's happening at larger timescales because as climate changes, we're investing a lot in installing wind turbines in different regions, but if climate changes so that the larger scale patterns change, what's going to happen to that wind resource? And we don't want to have a lot of stranded wind turbines in Texas that no longer have any wind available. So there are you know, decadal forecasting issues that need to be addressed as well as the multi-day. And, um, and zero to six hour timescales are also uh, critical for power balancing within the power grid. So meteorologists can take the Navier-Stokes equations and we make some assumptions about how we model turbulence. We solve them and we can take now the mesoscale tools that have been a very robust workhorse for the last several decades and large eddy simulation tools that can now communicate upscale to mesoscale models and this nesting of the two modeling approaches could be useful. There are a lot of researchy type of questions about what's an appropriate way to let turbulence from one model talk to turbulence in the other model, and then how do we validate that in the real world? And the answer is we need observations, and observations are becoming available now for winds between 100 and 200 meters above the surface. So I wanted to, to show some really fun large eddy simulations, and, and I recognize that I'm a meteorologist, and what's really fun to me may not be really fun to you, but Something that's kind of cool when you have terrain is you can have flow. Imagine that flow is coming from, from the left in this, in this picture. You have flow coming 
up the hill and then down the hill, but you actually get these recirculation zones in the wake of a hill. And we see this often in wind tunnels and we see it often in the real world, but it's really hard to get these to happen in meteorological models. So only recently were we able to get this to develop in large eddy simulations, and it has to be super high resolution. So we're talking horizontal resolution of eight meters, which is extremely computationally expensive. And we've been messing around with turbulence models and trying to figure out, okay, do we really have to use this 8-meter resolution or can we make some other assumptions and get the same behavior at coarser resolution so that we could actually use this in a forecasting mode because otherwise it's, it's not very useful. So on the left, I have the same simulation but at coarser resolution using turbulence modeling. Or TKE closure is another way to, of, of saying turbulence modeling. I have that for the, the standard closure. And you see we get flow up the hill and flow down the hill, but we don't get these nice recirculations. And on the right, in this instant, we have flow up the hill and flow down the hill, and then we get the recirculations. And that was using a, a new development for turbulence modeling that combines an approach that was developed at Stanford with an approach that was developed um, actually at the University of Colorado. And together, they can capture the correct physical behavior at much coarser resolution, and, um, and so we're trying to test that with, with real field observations now. Okay, so to summarize again, energy demand is increasing, and we have to couple our modeling tools that are continually being developed with observations, and uh, we have had a lot of success with our preliminary tests uh, of, this, of this work. So I'm happy to answer any questions about this as well as any other questions that you might have about wind energy. And I thank you for your attention, especially after lunch of pasta. <laughs>
you know, the, the 1.5 to 3 point something megawatt turbines that have hub heights around 100 meters. So they all have variable pitch. As for the smaller ones, the, the local residential wind or building integrated wind, there's lots of different designs, and I don't know. If the, the, yeah, the variable pitch is for different velocities of wind. Um, I didn't show a power curve here, but if this is velocity and this is power, uh, wind turbines usually have an area where they aren't really generating any power or a range of velocities where they aren't generating any power. And then there's a cut-in wind speed and then a cut-out where above this velocity they are going to, to pitch their blades totally so they won't rotate because the winds are too strong and they're, they're not designed to sustain those winds. So they, there's lots of things that they can do to efficiently generate power in, in this range here between cut-in and cut-out. That last part of the cut-off may explain. I've driven through Palm Springs regularly off and on, and I see for so frequently all those fellows up there not moving at all. I think, yeah. What a waste. Why can't they take advantage of this wind uh, being buffeted by? Yeah, well, there it, it could be that. it could The winds could be beyond cut-in. It could also be that there are maintenance issues with those particular turbines. I know in Palm Springs those are pretty old, and uh, once I think most turbines are designed to last for 20 years or so. So these are the ones in, in Palm Springs are getting beyond that that time scale. Um, so um, there are also power grid issues. The, one of the wind farms that I work with is in an area where there are lots of other wind farms. And so they actually compete with each other to sell energy to the power grid because the power grid says, I don't want any more than 4 or 5% of wind. So whoever sells it at the best price gets to sell it and everybody else has to curtail or basically not generate power. And that, that's one of the artifacts from, um, you know, our power grid developed to be dispatchable. And as we update and modernize, it, it will hopefully be different because it, they don't have curtailments in Europe. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know of anybody building ramps for the industrial scale wind turbines, but I know of people, and I think the company is near Sacramento, I'm not sure, that turbines that are on the order of, I think maybe 10 meters, they're actually ducted. So they have a larger area where they bring the, the wind in and they funnel it. And I, I don't know if that's actually gone to market or not, but I did read some literature about that a while ago. So yeah, good idea. Norway is doing that extensively, and actually one of the reasons Denmark has such high wind penetration is because they sell their excess power, the power that they can't use, to Norway, and Norway does a lot of, of elevated water storage. I don't know of anyone in the U.S. doing that, but I, I don't follow that literature, those discussions very much, so there may be somebody here doing that as well. But yeah, storage is a big issue, and you know, as a meteorologist, I really love working on these models and doing the forecasting bit, and if we solve storage, then I won't do that. <laughs> I'll, I'll have to find something else to work on, but that would be a good thing if we were able to solve storage, because that would be good for all sorts of, of renewable energy. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yes, you're, you're exactly... Yeah, you're exactly right. There's a lot of research in um, not really compensating technology, but using wind and hydropower to balance each other. And in some cases, in parts of California, wind and solar to balance each other. So, yeah, that, that's, it's nice that two fluctuating sources can kind of work together. The, the work that I've done in looking at resource assessment, um, prime locations are actually offshore from a meteorological perspective because you often have steady wind. The, the variability with height is often not as significant. Off the coast of California, there are big issues because the, the bottom drops off rather quickly, and, and until we get floating wind turbines, it will be a little bit hard to, to deal with that. 
but in general, locations with steady, strong wind are our best. And, you know, there's a lot of that in the Midwest if you're looking on land in the U.S., um, as long as you can deal with the low-level jets. There are cases where channeled flow is nice, so the Altamont Pass to Hatchby Pass were considered attractive for those reasons. There are other effects that you might want to take into account in those locations and, like, environmental impacts and things like that. I, I was, as a meteorologist, I was surprised when I started doing this work that what I thought was a perfect site meteorologically was just not ever considered because of all of the other practical questions that come into play. So land rights, uh, proximity to, to power stations, substations and transformers, that's actually a big deal. So I think you asked me if anyone last night asked about birds and bats. <laughs> that, <laughs> that is true. So I'm going to ask you, so <laughs> are, there, are there issues with wildlife with these wind turbines? Yes, there, there are issues with, uh, so the, for context, um, the Altamont Pass is one of the oldest wind farms in California, and it is also notorious because the number of raptors killed there exceeds the number of birds killed in all the other wind farms in the rest of the world put together. So it's right in the middle of a migratory path that they weren't probably aware of when they were installing it. And the type of turbines that they were able to install then were especially attractive to birds for perching. So um, it, it, it's, you know, we, we're all human beings and we do our best, but nobody realized that, you know, these shaft type, these smooth shaft um, turbine bases are good because they aren't attractive to animals to nest. And the lattice type structures that were used in the 80s were especially attractive to nesting birds. Uh, they didn't realize until Altamont that it was critically important to maintain the concrete base because otherwise you develop holes in the concrete and um, burrowing animals come and build their burrows there and the raptors like to eat the burrowing animals and the, the rats and stuff. So it was just a, a cascade of, of things that were not optimal. However, if you look at how many birds get killed from other things that we do, other means of producing energy. If you look at what happens because of mercury poisoning from burning coal and, and that kind of stuff, it, it's not as clear of a picture. So there are environmental consequences, but it's also important to realize that there are environmental consequences to the status quo that we may not be taking into account appropriately. All right, we'll take one more question and then we have refreshments before our last panel. Yes, I'm going to ask, uh, how effective do you think the United States has been Okay, so, so the question is about siting efficiency in the United States, and, and I think that wind farms in the United States are actually pretty efficient, but we haven't, we don't have nearly as many wind farms compared to our power usage. So, you know, in the global picture, our efficiency hasn't been that great, but uh, I think wind farm to wind farm, I think that we're doing pretty well. Uh, other people may have looked into that more closely than I have, so I can't fully comment. Okay. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll ask a lot of 